welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Wak, and Attawandron peoples, on lands connected with the London Township and Slumber Treaties of 1796, and the District 1 of Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous populations, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land, you know, vital contributors of our society. Um, so I have a few people to introduce tonight. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Museum London for uh, co-presenting this talk with us in line with their exhibition, Garden Ship and State. Uh, and here on behalf of the museum is Curator of Public Programs, Anita Beninosti. Um, so she's going to give us a, a brief uh, hello <laughs> and talk to you a little bit about the museum. Oh, I just realized I don't have a mic. I'm not sure where I'm Oh, well, I'm just talking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi everybody, uh, I work at Museum London. Anybody here been to Museum London? <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> a few hands. And do you remember when you came to the museum, how much it cost? Three hundred. Oh, did I get crickets? Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I know, those are <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies front. So Museum London is by donation, so those of you that have to come down. Uh, uh, existing with our democratic values of making the museum and its collections available to everybody um, is by donation. So next time you're downtown, or if you're not a downtown goer, please come by. We are located at the Forks of the Thames, or the Dash Kanzibi, as we are now starting to refer to it. Um, I'm the curator there, I'm in uh, programs, and I'm in charge of creating all the activities. I basically activate the exhibitions for the public. So if you're thinking of having a career in museum management or museum studies or art gallery studies, um, programming positions are growing way more and more in the uh, art gallery sector. I've been doing this work over 20 years. I started at the Vancouver Art Gallery after doing a BFA in art history and creative writing at UBC. So that's my little pitch for your career's futures. If you ever want to talk to me about this work, it's very, very fun. I get to work with people like Liza and Patrick and the artists, so that's great. Um, and my little pitch for the museum, um, you're going to hear all about gardenship and state tonight. Um, it is one of two big exhibitions we've opened this fall, the other is an exhibition of a touring exhibition from the Canadian War Museum called The Wounded, um, of uh, photos of 18 Afghanistan veterans um, and their physical experience and the wounds and the healing that they've gone through coming back to Canada. So that is a rare and excellent show to come see. And then we have two permanent collection exhibitions. Uh, we have our Taking the Long View exhibition, which is up ongoing where you can see a history of Museum London's collections from very, uh, from our traditional painting collections up to contemporary artists. And uh, they also have, currently have a history show about the history of uh, the Labatt's Brewery in this city. Um, so lots of great stuff to see at a very affordable rate. If you're still feeling like, eh, I don't go downtown very often, uh, Dundas Place is the new Flex Street downtown. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you knew that there's live music on Dundas Street every Thursday and Friday night for free. Go down, the street shut down. It's a pedestrian walk. There's all kinds of fun stuff going down. Come visit the museum while you're down there. So lots to do. So that's my little pitch um, for the museum. And I will hand it up to Eliza. Thank you. Um, uh, usually we get to go down to Museum London and have this talk there. Unfortunately, with capacity limits, you know, we're having it here. Um, but maybe next term, if things continue to ease up and uh, they get to open up a bit more, we can uh, have the next talk down there. Because then you guys can see the space. Well, then you have to see the space. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm just going to hand it over to co-curator and Western Prof, Patrick Mann. Uh, many of you know he's going to introduce the exhibition and uh, the artists and uh, talk to you a little bit about the process. Um, and I'll just give a quick bio that, again, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with Patrick Mann. He's an artist, writer, curator, and professor of digital arts at Western University. He was the director of the School for Advanced Studies in Arts and Humanities for the previous four years, and has been teaching in the visual arts department for over 25 years. Uh, Mann's artwork has been exhibited widely in Canada and internationally. Recently, and uh, recent and forthcoming exhibitions include Patrick Mann, Messengers Forum at the Thames Art Gallery, and Written on the Earth at the Macintosh Gallery. His work is included in numerous private, corporate, and museum collections. So uh, please join me in welcoming Patrick. Thanks very much, Liza, and it's really nice to see you all. 
I will speak to you really briefly, um, and then I'll be introducing Michelle and uh, eventually Paul. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this exhibition, Garden, Ship, and State, which both Paul and Michelle are in, and just give you a sense of, of what the exhibition is trying to do, and then show you a few teaser slides that'll make you want to come down and, and see for yourself. So this is an exhibition that I actually initiated through getting a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada grant. And when I was fortunate enough to do that, I, I actually had worked with a number of people to apply for the grant. And one of the important people who was involved right from the beginning is Jeff Thomas. He's a very important Indigenous photographer and curator in Canada. He lives in Ottawa. He did a really um, significant show on residential schools from the National Archives that went around Canada for a number of years. So Jeff is an amazing collaborator. And when I approached him, it was recognizing that he himself, he calls himself an urban Iroquois. And Jeff is somebody who's really invested in, I would say, nation to nation discussions. He's invested in collaboration. And so he's been a fantastic person to work on this exhibition with. I won't say too much more, but um, certainly you'll, you'll hear and see more of Jeff uh, if you connect with the exhibition. The title of the exhibition, Garden, Ship and State, is obviously kind of poetic in certain ways, but in simple terms, I think that the terms of engagement are around the environment and it as a kind of global challenge and, and you could say crisis and decolonization. And so we could unpack the whole notion of a garden ship. I'm not gonna do that now, but um, I think it's, it's important to recognize that in a sense, the title sets up a kind of problematic. And so one of the ways that I think we're, we're engaging with the problematic is across cultures, across generations, with a really sort of dynamic range of 20 artists and writers. So when you come and see the exhibition, you'll see a whole range of work. Um, I'm happy to say there's numerous grads from Western who are involved in the exhibition, and uh, Paul is one of them, and Michelle is actually a PhD student here at Western. So it's been nice to involve some graduates from Western in this high-level exhibition. Um, I, and I want to say that overall, all the artists are from Turtle Island, except for a couple who, um, Mary Mattingly, who's from the United States, and many of the artists have roots from across the globe beyond Turtle Island. Um, the show is interdisciplinary, it's interactive, and it moves out of the museum to include the London Public Library. Um, there's going to be a piece on the lawn momentarily, and um, when you come, it's interactive insofar as there's a journal. We're calling it a journal. It's a little kind of handbook that allows you to make notes, to engage, maybe you want to write poetry, but around the themes of the exhibition that I think, um, you know, one of the things we want to do with um, the exhibition and thinking about the public is actually have people gain a sense of agency, uh, recognition of responsibility in relation to these issues and problems, but hopefully a sense of, of possibility. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly go through these slides and then we'll get on and you can hear from Michelle and Paul. So this is the entrance to the exhibition. These are giant photographs by Laurie Blondeau. She's an indigenous artist who's now living in Manitoba, originally from Saskatchewan. I won't actually talk about the works at length. This is the entrance to the show and Michelle is gonna talk about her work so you'll have a sense of why that bison head is there. And we see the work of Jeff Thomas in the background. Uh, Amelia Faye is the curator of uh, the Hudson Bay collection at the Manitoba Museum. So she borrowed these moccasins uh, from the collection and made what you might think of as a little embroidered intervention um, in text. So she doesn't identify as an artist, but she did something I think we would call an artwork. This is the work of Ron Benner, who's a really important London-based artist. It's a work from really a period of about eight years, around 30 years ago, that really looks at the north-south movement of food and also language and culture. This is a view of, of the sort of long hall of the museum, and there's a giant, wonderful uh, hoop piece by um, Quinn Smallboy, and then these model-like structures, uh, kind of almost like children's toys by uh, Sean Caulfield. Um, on the right-hand side, we have an amazing video work by Jessica Karuhanga, who is an MFA grad, uh, or a, a, sorry, a BFA grad from Western, 
and then the mosaics of Jamili Hassan, who's an important London artist. And then we have here some photographs by Mark Kasumovic, who is from Hamilton, now lives in England. And we have a library setting by Mary Mattingly. There's another version of it at the public library. It's called Ecotopian Library. We have another mosaic by Jamili Hassan and a chair piece by Andres Vilar that plays bird sounds and also electronic sounds that mimic birds. There's some of my work on the walls there that is based on thinking about flags at thresholds. And then some textile pieces by uh, Sharmista Carr, who also was a Western student. This giant drawing that focuses on questions of, of a kind of settlement um, and assumptions around settlement by Michael Farnan and other photographs by Laurie Blondeau. There's a video by Michael Farnan that actually deals, he, he does tree planting in BC and it deals with some of the kind of um, environmental kind of strife and struggle around pulp mills. And in the background, there's a work by Ashley Snook that deals with what are called phragmites, they're invasive species. And this is by Adrian Stimson. He's an indigenous artist who lives at Sixtica Reserve in Alberta. And this is all based on his research into the Children's Bumblebee Society, which was a really important uh, so teaching society on his reserve. And in some senses, his work brings it forward. And lastly, there's Paul's work on the right-hand side with this huge sign made of grass, and then Quinn's work. So I'm gonna stop there. And now I have the pleasure to introduce Michelle Wilson. So Michelle, who I will say, uh, maybe I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm her supervisor and her PhD, and it's a privilege. She's an artist and mother currently residing as an uninvited guest on Treaty 6 territory here in London, Ontario. Her work makes palpable the presence and absence of bison and their inseparability from the land and its people. In the Eurocentric archive, bison bodies have been used to convey colonial knowledge systems, and their story of survival has been used to perpetuate perpetuate myths of settler saviors. This is the true legacy that Wilson, as a feminist of settler descent studying in colonial institution, has inherited and is confronting. Michelle is currently a PhD student here at Western, and it's a pleasure to welcome her to speak with you. And I have to give you that. I'm going to go back and forth between two computers, so I hope it's not too strange. So thank you, Patrick, for that introduction. Um, so I've titled my talk Conspiring with the More Than Human because I want to challenge you all to hold in your minds what is the difference between speaking for a non-human creature and speaking with a non-human creature. And I use the term conspiring because I see the work I'm doing as undermining the human exceptionalism and the white supremacy that orders so much of our lives. And I, I always link those two things together because I think in our dominant worldview, they are connected and inseparable. Oops, I'm changing on the wrong screen. <laughs> um, let me just, oh, I'm going to turn this. This is a video. Turn the volume down so I can talk over top of it. There we go. Um, so when I was completing my MFA at um, the University of Manitoba, actually at my thesis defense, a member of my committee asked me, why was I making photos and sculptures that dealt with animals conceptually and our relationship with them conceptually, and why I wasn't actually making work with them? And I didn't have an answer then. Um, and because I really take seriously what it means to be in relation with other creatures and do that ethically. Um, and I'm not really sure that I have an answer to that question now, but it continues to motivate my work, asking how do I make work in relation with the more than human? Um, so this was peace was an early attempt to move into that realm. Um, and it also represents the beginning of my work in collaboration with others. So I really love this piece. Um, it is about whooping cranes and whooping cranes imprint on their handlers at birth. 
and almost all whooping cranes are born into captivity. Um, and so their handlers make these like hodgepodge homemade puppet costumes. They don't speak. They completely kind of annihilate their humanity and attempt to raise whooping cranes to be whooping cranes. And um, so I thought, well, I'm going to make my own version of these costumes. And I uh, collaborated with two dancers to look at cr whooping crane mating dances and come up with our own hybrid version. Um, and just to, at the beginning of this piece, I give context by painting a kind of sound collage of found audio from one of the first um, biologists to successfully raise a whooping crane in captivity. And it, through that story, I draw attention to how strange and silly and complicated and beautiful this relationship with a prehistoric species on the brink of extinction can be. So I'm just gonna keep going. Okay. So this is another piece from the same time. Um, so I um, heard this episode of a podcast called Radio Lab, and they were talking about how hearing the heartbeat of another person can create this very profound empathetic response that often makes people quite uncomfortable. Um, and I thought about harnessing that but to harness it towards an animal to whom our empathy is often not extended. Um, and so I created my own digital stethoscope and I found a, a farm that was willing to have me. And I went out and I recorded the heartbeat of one of the cows that they were raising for, for beef, for slaughter. Um, and while I was there, I spoke to the farmers who were not people that I thought I had a lot in common with and that like, in a lot of ways, I felt like I was opposed to. But in speaking to them, I, I found that they could tell me this kind of narrative of this, this cow. Um, and I took a lot from that. I developed a biography of her from their perspective. And um, I created this story that talks both about my coming to know her, her life, and my own feelings of compl complicity in that. All right, so that brings me to, to the work that I'm doing now. And it all started um, when I was lucky to get an artist residency at Riding Mountain National Park called the Deep Bay Artist Residency. And I got two years in a row, 2016 and 2017. And um, I went out there to observe and listen to bison and record their communication. Um, and also to speak to the people at the park who were responsible for caring for them. Uh, and um, so I went, I listened to them, I learned so much, but I also learned an awful lot by what was left out of what I was told about how, about this story of how bison came to be a controlled and corralled species in Canada's conservation system. And this question has motivated my work and has been, people will tell you, quite an obsession uh, for five years now. So my dissertation exhibition that was up at the Macintosh this summer um, was called Remnants, Outlaws, and Wallows, Practices for Understanding Bison. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a few of the works that were in that exhibition. The um, piece that you see on the floor here with the bus, the ceramic bus, they are based on the taxidermy form um, that, the form that goes under the taxidermy, so then the hide is stretched over. Um, and by tipping them onto their backs, I feel like I changed the relationship. I changed the technology. The technology of, of taxidermy is so often about um, turning a living being into a symbol of a species, but also conveying something about man's mastery. Um, so these pieces actually have speakers in those wooden bases. And when you interact with the painted sensors on the floor, they play those recordings. So those recordings were actually field recordings that I made on those residencies in Riding Mountain. And what's interesting is when I decided to go out there, I didn't really know that much about bison. And people said to me, 
you're going at the rut. That's the best time because you will hear all these bulls calling back and forth and doing their bravado sort of thing. And when I got there, I found that I wasn't actually that interested in bulls. Um, talking to people and observing things, I realized that there is always tons of communication going on between cows and their calves and between cows and other cows. And that's because that is where the social structure of the bison herd is. And they care for one and each other. You know, they have hierarchies. It's this whole complex thing, but we always focus because we view the world, the animal world, through a patriarchal lens that the bulls, the fighting, the strength, that's what's important to bison society. And I'm, I'm standing here in my own perspective. That wasn't what was interesting to me. Um, so these pieces represent a cow and a calf. And then um, the piece on the wall here um, documents through hundreds and hundreds of embroidery stitches the movements of eight bison from that um, herd that I was observing. So I was lucky enough to get to collaborate with the bison warden there at Friday Mountain, and they had eight of their bison with GPS collars on them. So he was able to give me the data from the two weeks that I was there, and then I spent the next six months stitching this piece. Um, so it records both my, re my relationship with them because I was in that space and, and influencing their movement, but also how they interact with uh, the land under fence conditions. And then the piece that you see on the far right with the blue border came out of discussions with a wolf biologist named um, Christina Prokopenko. And I happened to meet her for coffee when I was at the park and she described the lives of these two wolves that she had named Romeo and Julian. And um, I was so moved by her telling of the story, I, I wanted to make a piece around that. So she was kind enough to give me her data from her GPS tracking collars. Um, and I stitched this, but I also thought like that the stitches aren't compelling enough. The act of stitching isn't compelling enough. It's her telling of the story that gives context that, that really moved me. So I asked her to record herself telling that story. She gave me an hour and a half, and I took that um, recording and cut it down and made it into an audio work that concisely spoke about these two wolves and what they meant to her. Um, and I think it's important to have a piece about wolves in a show that's about bison, because um, you can't really understand the story of conservation in Canada without understanding the ideology around wolves. So. Um, because conservation as it's practiced under colonial systems views bison and other game animals as a resource, the goal is always to just increase the amount of them. Um, it's about the numbers. And when you see bison as a resource for your exploitation, animals like wolves are seen as a nuisance that reduces the, pr the productivity of that resource. Um, it is changing now, but th this has been the practice for so long. And so um, I have to mention that the writing from around the time of the bison extermination often um, it compares, equates indigenous people with wolves in really disturbing and, and disgusting ways. And so the, the wolves were eradicated from large swaths of Canada and almost annihilated from Riding Mountain National Park, but they have since made a comeback. Um, this piece is called Bone Rick, and it references the piles of bones that were left on the prairies after the mass slaughter of bison. Um, and so something people might not know is that historically, and still sometimes today, your black ink is actually made from the charred bones of animals. Um, often it's cattle, but when you had millions of um, millions and millions of bison bodies left on the plains, um, that was a free and finite resource that could be collected. Um, so between the 1880s and, and the 1890s, your bone black ink was probably made from bison bones. Um, and yeah, so because the bison were slaughtered en masse in the United States to feed a hide market, 
and in Canada to feed a network of trappers and traders employed by the Hudson's Bay Company, both acts that were facilitated and encouraged by colonial governments because starving populations made it easier to have land grabs. Um, there were just spies and bones left, spies and bodies left to rot all over the place. Um, and so I was so moved by this idea that your own annihilation could be recorded with your own body um, that I decided to try and make my own ink. Um, the ink went white instead of black my first time around, but I, I rolled with it. And I, so I made these prints um, and I wanted to make as many as I could with my finite resource of bone ink. So we wound up, I wound up getting 101. Um, and I feel like you get a feeling of immensity but also something dissipating, di dissipating or disappearing. Um, there is an audio piece that goes with that as well. Not going to play it. Don't have time. Uh, <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Um, so this is the last piece from this exhibition that I'm going to talk about. And it started when I got my own bison taxidermy um, shoulder mount and I found it on Kijiji. Um, and I went through the process of deconstructing it, which wasn't something that people do. It was really um, kind of experimental, but I did it as a performance at the Archaeology Museum in, here in London and documented it. So you can see that in the two small screens um, on the wall there. That's me taking it off and then restoring it and repairing it. Um, and then after I had done that, I proposed to a friend of mine, the artist Casey Adams, she lives in Winnipeg, um, that I pass the stewardship of the hide onto her. Um, and so we developed a performance. Let's just start playing this a little bit. So we developed this performance slash ceremony for the sending, receiving, and honoring of this hide, and we documented it. Um, and then we worked with a video editor to create two videos that responded to one another. Um, and it became this beautiful intercultural and intergenerational act to honor the bison. Um, and in it, we pass on to our families knowledge about working with clay. So here you see Casey opening the box that we had the bison sent in with her mother and her son. Mm -hmm. And then this is me and my daughter, Asa. And I think I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, I'll just stop there. We had wanted to be able to do that exchange in person and, and come together, but of course, being in two different provinces in the height of COVID, it was impossible. Um, okay. So that brings me to gardenship. Um, so a few years ago, I discovered a post by um, Dr. Randy Mui. He's the zoologist at the Manito Manitoba Museum. And he had done all this detective work trying to identify this one, sorry, um, tax, this one taxidermied bison in their collection. And it led me down this rabbit hole of trying to dig through all this archival documentation and literature um, to tell the story of the specific ancestors of the bison that I had met at Riding Mountain. Um, and because there was such a genetic bottleneck, at one point, um, I can literally chase back those bison to five bison calves that were taken um, from the land in Saskatchewan. And so this map that I have in the Gardenship and State Exhibition is an interactive textile map. Uh, and it quite literally does this. Each strand of thread records one bison. Some of them are cut or broken because that bison died in the process of being moved and shipped around um, in captivity. 
And when you touch each section of the map, the wires act as, or the threads act as sensors, and they play um, a short poetic version of that story. Um, yeah. So yeah, all the stories are very personal. They came out of a lot of research. Um, and they try, I'm going to play one piece in particular that is not so research heavy, seemingly, um, but it actually recounts the, the capture of some of these bison from the perspective of a bison. And how I did that was I read the journals and the notes of the captor, the person that was going to capture them. And through that, I kind of switched the perspective that was being represented. I'm going to let this one play. Oh, and I just wanted to also acknowledge that um, my partner, Angus Kirkshank, did the sound design. And poet Sile Engler helped me convert my huge essays into manageable little snippets for the piece. We are grazing, hidden in the breaks between sandhills. Always alert, our ears panning for the sounds of men. My body oriented toward the wind, waiting for the odor that twins my fraught nerves and triggers a flight. I don't want to leave this place. The snow is just melted from the slopes, moistening the thirsty earth below, reviving the scrubby grass after a long winter. There are so few of us now, so few babies. We cannot let down our guard to breed as we used to. Two lazy bulls follow us, but they barely have the energy to register when we are in estrus. When we do conceive, our bodies can no longer nourish the unborn. We are haunted by those stolen from us. Mothers who aren't killed fighting off the snatchers return. So then I just wanted to talk briefly about this last piece. Um, I mean, I call it a piece, but it's not really. Um, we call him the outlaw bison. He's the bison that I was talking about at, before the, the zoologist was trying to track down his identity. Um, and he has been brought in from the Manitoba Museum. And his story is interesting because he resisted being loaded onto a train on the Flathead Reservation in Montana when the Canadian government bought his herd. And so he was shot and mounted and named the outlaw bison. Um, and his, his story is one of the stories, or the, the story of his herd is one of the stories that's recorded in that piece. Um, so it's so meaningful that they, his physical body is in the space with it. Um, yeah. 
yeah, I, I wanted to bring him to the museum and put him on his back and put him in relationship with that map to really reframe the story of Canada's salvation through conservation. Um, and Patrick and Jeff Thomas and everyone at, at both museums made it possible. And when he was unboxed and unloaded, it was a very emotional moment for me. And um, we welcomed, Adrian Stimson was there and he welcomed him to the space um, with a blessing. And um, actually when we were there, Adrian told me about his experiences with this bison's descendants. And so I have recorded an audio essay that goes with him and it's available through the space. So I invite you to go and sit with him and listen to it. Um, but Adrian also had his story about the future of, of this bison, his ancestors, or sorry, his descendants. And so we hope that, I hope that Adrian will record it. He said he will. And then we will kind of have the both of us standing at the same point and one person looking back and one person looking forward. Um, so hopefully those two will be available someday soon. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was amazing. Um, I'm kind of sorry that we aren't asking for questions now. We are going to have a discussion. And so please hold on to your questions because we'll make sure there's time for that. So now I have the privilege to introduce Paul Chartrand, who's a graduate of, of Western with an MFA. And I was thinking about Michelle's work and thinking about the fact that it takes risk and it requires a little bit of, well, we might even call it bravery, to do some of this kind of work because it's complex. And I think Paul's work shares in, in some of that risk taking absolutely in different ways. So Paul uh, doesn't use the word plant when he talks about his work in his, his, uh, his resume here. So I won't use the word plant either. Paul constructs sculptural habitats populated with living agents that operate in animate assemblages. He finds inspiration in the blurry definition of culture and nature, intending for his work to foster dialogue regarding what he sees as a problematic category. So he completed his undergraduate degree at Guelph, and then, as said, his master's degree at Western. He now lives and works along the Ose Canyon Hate Te, which is the Willow River in Mohawk, and I thought I would give it a shot, also known as the Grand River, and that's, um, his home is in Dunville, Ontario. So I really admire and um, am honored to have Paul here to talk to us today. I can just put it in my pocket, right? Ah, okay. Okay, setting the bar high, Michelle. Um, I don't think my presentation will be uh, quite as long, but hopefully it will be agreeable. So it's good to see everybody in person. I know I spoke uh, to you, not so much with you, uh, a couple weeks ago for the panel with um, Macintosh Gallery. Uh, okay. And I'm also going to be juggling two computers here. So um, just to give a little bit of a preface, um, that kind of reiterates a little bit of what uh, Patrick was saying. Um, I I engage uh, environmental and cultural issues through the construction of these um, sort of living uh, assemblages um, built from a combination of, um, I'll say plants here, um, found objects and usually hydroponic systems, but not always. Um, the, I, I try and consider the, the meaningful roles uh, that each discrete part has. So um, thinking about living in, uh, the living entities individually, uh, the plants, the inanimate objects, um, and the human object or the human actions. So my role as a, an artist and a gardener, um, and thinking about how these uh, human actions can appear mundane, but framed in the context of 
uh, thriving and interconnected uh, like web of kind of being with others. Uh, everything kind of becomes a member of a community in these sculptural assemblages. So I, I tend to think of these, and I mean, sculpture is kind of a tricky term, but um, I tend to think of these sculptures as um, more like in the realm of assemblage. And I think of them as sort of uh, little communities in, in and of themselves. Um, so with this in mind, uh, for the Gardenship project, I wanted to emphasize community uh, as well. And I wanted to ask, how can an artwork act as a focal point and a catalyst for social organization and activism? And that's something that I'll address with my collaborative work with Michelle uh, later on. Um, and how can it act as uh, an ever-changing memorial um, um, thinking about things as a tangible reminder of the ephemeral nature of life, um, the written word and art itself. And um, everything, everything we know will eventually return back to the ground and the land. But before that happens, uh, it'll be a part of a, a bigger assemblage and a, a bigger community. So these, these projects are kind of acting as a smaller sort of facsimile of these larger um, communities at play in the world. Um, yeah, so for, for Gardenship and State, I developed a sort of a triad of different um, objects, all based around the growth of plants. So um, in a more basic kind of way, I wanted to tie everything together uh, with the, the sort of the primacy of the molecule of chlorophyll and thinking about uh, its foundational role in uh, not only plant biology and ecology, but also thinking about how it affects us and other animals. Um, and so the, these projects really embody a kind of an almost like religious transubstantiation of kind of the, the sunlight and uh, the minerals in the ground and water into um, the body of the plant. Um, and yeah, so thinking about how these plants build their own bodies from sunlight and then act um, not only as their own entity, but also as fuel for us and other non-humans as well. So I just want to give like a little bit of uh, context for each of the projects that I worked on. Um, so this is one of my earlier hydroponic, um, I'll call it an experiment because I didn't know if it would work, but um, I built this table for uh, an exhibition, like a, an annual exhibition in Toronto called the Grow Up at uh, the Gladstone Hotel. Um, it, uh, it's usually a really fun confluence of design and art and um, landscape architecture and all sorts of different um, kind of ways of thinking about uh, environmentalism. And um, for this project, I, I basically built this small hydroponic table um, and populated it with uh, mint plants that I then harvested uh, during the exhibition and brewed into tea and used it as um, a sort of uh, a ritual where people could um, discuss um, things like uh, yeah, consuming plants and specific plants in general. We talked about coffee a lot and tea and kind of the, the colonial background of both of those crops, which is very in-depth um, and something that I think I might have images of later as well. Um, this is a work from uh, my master's program, one of my favorite pieces, um, just trying to sort of embody this sort of balance that I talk about a lot. And so I have this really traditional tool, uh, the scythe, and it's balanced at a fulcrum right here. And there's a small sort of hydroponic system built here and the lights hanging from the top. So you can see these kind of different parts coming together in a sort of balanced assemblage. Um, and a lot of the work that I did in my master's, pro, uh, my master's thesis um, had, the, had a sort of I don't want to say ramshackle, but like a DIY, a very DIY kind of nitty gritty aesthetic because a lot of um, the research that I've done into these kind of systems has been through YouTube and um, Googling and blogs. And so like it's, it's mostly self-taught. I haven't taken any courses in it or anything. And so a lot of these systems are kind of built with what's at hand and repurposing things, recycling things. And uh, yeah. 
so, and this is another uh, direction that some of my work has gone. Um, we have living uh, text installations that, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get caught up here. Um, so these living text installations have been kind of a part of my practice uh, as a tangent to the sort of assemblage work that I do. So I basically prepare these um, sometimes more sculptural, sometimes less sculptural uh, beds or environments for the plants to thrive in or not thrive in if the pigeons get to it, um, which was the case with this work. They kind of helped rewrite it. Um, so this was a sort of a crossword piece. Um, these are all four by eight foot garden boxes. Um, and this was at the Main Squared Festival in Toronto. And this, it, it did say eat the concrete, but like I said, the pigeons kind of got to it. Um, this was in my thesis exhibition and it said uh, medium in the purple, but the green kind of overtook it a bit. Um, and that's something that I'm really interested in with a lot of these text pieces is how they're disrupted by uh, natural processes. And so um, the word medium I used specifically because there's no soil in this piece. It's all uh, a hydroponic media, um, which is just another word for like a, a non-soil um, grow material. Um, this was a piece that I did for Culture Days in London. So this was before they turned Dundas into, um, I think it's brick there now. Uh, this is down by uh, down by the JLC, or it's not the JLC anymore, is it? Um, it down by the arena but, downtown. Um, it's but, Budweiser Gardens or something now? Yeah. So um, this was kind of a play on uh, all one and alone, uh, kind of mixed into one word. And then these were some kind of sketches from my sketchbook. Um, a lot of the times when I'm doing studio visits, I don't have a lot of tangible work in the studio to show people. It's more sketches because uh, I have a limited amount of space and I tend to work bigger than I think I should. Um, so yeah, these are just all different sort of ideas that I've thought about moving things in more of a sculptural direction, more vertical as opposed to just laying down. This was a piece from uh, Montreal. Well, actually a, a kind of duo of pieces. Uh, this one's hard to read because it's a little bit small. Um, but this one says common ground. It was more of a reframing of the plants that were already there. So this was a kind of a public park in West Montreal in uh, Saint Laurent. And um, this was, uh, the text here says lost in transition. So I wanted to kind of call to mind the, the sort of transient nature of the space. And there's a, like a transit hub that's right beside. So there's a lot of through traffic, but not a whole lot of people sitting and living in the space. And I did this performance piece. Um, this was when COVID was still uh, kind of just starting. So usually a part of the text projects um, is uh, sort of a ritual harvest and a sharing of the plants and um, consuming them in a like a shared meal. But for this project, because of COVID, uh, we decided that maybe I would go in a more performative direction. So I sat down and I ate, um, I'm pretty sure I ate Lost In because transition, yeah, I, I almost made myself sick, but uh, it was a lot of plants. And um, so I kind of sat there for two hours eating uh, pea sprouts. And then, so this is the project in the museum, uh, All Flesh is Grass, which is based on, here I've got things a little bit out of order. Um, so it's based on a, a fairly well-known uh, passage from the Christian Bible. Um, it's in Isaiah 46, and it says, the voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. And generally, um, the, the passage has been used as a sort of epitaph um, on gravestones, especially in the early 1900s uh, and late 1800s as a sort of way of connecting uh, to the kind of ephemeral nature of life and how like ashes to ashes, dust to dust, that kind of uh, sentiment that was uh, common in um, Christian philosophies at the time. Um, so I, I really consider these texts to be 
uh, very important. The, the piece is no different, or this piece is no different. Um, the relationship between etymology, so the evolution of words uh, themselves, and the idea of like root texts is uh, very symbolic here through having literally grown the text um, and having it held in place on the wall. So this one is vertical, it's a framed wall piece, and it's held in place by the dried roots. Um, again, I was hoping for things to be a little bit more um, tangible in a space, but with uh, museum um, concert, conservatory uh, restrictions being what they are, it's, it's fairly sealed um, within the frame. And um, yeah, so I think in some ways this is the, the most simple work in the exhibition. Um, certainly technically it was pretty simple. Um, but as with any of the living text projects, uh, I find the more that you uh, can kind of contemplate the the words and the context that they're in, the more kind of readings that you can branch off. Oh. So this is the project that presented the most complicated uh, technical aspects to it. So this project currently is housed in a small cafe in my uh, the place that I live now in Dunville. Um, it's a five by 11 foot-ish table. So it's, it's basically a, a much larger version of the table that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and I wanted to continue my textual kind of context in the show. So having um, the purple plant lights in there, I think gives it a really specific sort of uh, science fiction-y glow. And, um, Almost all the materials in it are recycled from past projects. And um, yeah, I think just the frame and the, the actual reservoir are new. Uh, it's a combination of different edible sprouts uh, that are actually gonna be used in the menu at the cafe. So that's a really nice workaround to the, um, the COVID restrictions that we have in certain spaces. So the text for this iteration of the work is sustain. Um, both as a, a shortened version of, uh, you know, sustainable or sustainability, and um, the idea of sustaining um, people and the idea of sustain uh, musically. There's like this continuation of a single note. So I, I really like working with words and phrases that have lots of different meanings and history, uh, just like the objects that I tend to work with. These are just some other views. So in here, um, this is a metal frame and you have the ventilation fan here. It sucks air. So air comes in here, passes over the plants and comes up through here and shoots out uh, the other side. And this is just a, kind of a closer up view. And so this piece specifically is, um, this stupid thing, um, is streaming live at the museum. Um, again, because I was just trying to in the, um, the, the restrictions in, in that space. So um, I'm just trying to find it here. Yeah, so I, I wanted to build this project as a, a sort of social, um, like a nexus of sort of social activity, the way the, the original tea table was, and having it um, as a sort of hub of activity in the, uh, in the gallery space as well. Uh, this one is obviously more akin to like a banquet table or a traditional harvest table um, where you would have uh, families or communities gathered together post-harvest to celebrate and give thanks. And um, yeah, so about the, uh, the recycled stuff again, the, the windows were sourced from my late grandfather's uh, home renovation and uh, the wood was repurposed from another project. And um, yeah, they, they just allow you to have a view, like a really clear view of everything that's going on inside. And um, yeah, so these, these lights in here are all waterproof and the water is, it's pretty hard to see, but there's um, an irrigation hose that runs the, like a kind of a circuit around there and it uh, sprays uh, periodically. So yeah, and logistically, uh, originally, like the this exhibition has been planned for a number of years now. And in the beginning, before COVID, um, we had big plans for it to have uh, workshops associated with it and such. 
Uh, and those things are going to be happening at the cafe in Dunville. And we're hoping that some of them can be live streamed into the gallery space uh, and go from that way. As a, a kind of a, a nice workaround that attacks, or not attacks, um, attaches this work uh, from London to kind of my home community. Um, COVID, COVID, COVID. Yeah, so after the harvest, um, we were hoping to have uh, poet Tom Cole uh, involved with helping to kind of process the plants into chlorophyll ink, which features in the next work, um, and work with people in uh, kind of developing their own uh, poetic kind of interpretations of the rest of the exhibition. Um, okay. Yeah, so I won't get into too much about the streaming because it's not so much about the work, but that has been uh, quite the process. Um, and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So then we come to the memorial scroll. So this, so this is, there's kind of multiple parts to this project, but the first part is like it, it began uh, basically uh, I had come across a number of articles about um, people who've been killed defending the land uh, around the world. And um, I was really compelled by the, the number of names in these lists. So I decided that I wanted to try and uh, develop a, a work that kind of memorialized these people. And um, so I, I ended up kind of coming up with this idea of a, a really long scroll work. So using chlorophyll ink, it's really hard to see, I apologize, um, but I, I processed some chlorophyll ink from the plants uh, that I've grown in some of my projects. Uh, and you can see the ink well here. And using just a, a quill pen, I, I took time over the course of a couple of months and, um, excuse me, uh, wrote each name um, that I found. In, in not like a chronological order or anything, it was is the order that I found um, found the names in these articles and uh, archives. And um, it ended up being about 150 feet worth of names. Not that that means anything, but um, basically this is a, it's a roll of receipt paper. And, um, oh, I went to the wrong project. Yeah, so so these names they're all they all belong to people from uh, the activist communities and indigenous communities from around the world, uh, particularly in places where uh, extractive economies are really dominant. So, places like Central and South America, Southeast Asia, those those places really disproportionately shoulder the burden um, of these kind of conflicts that result in these deaths, well, murders and deaths. Um, so in the museum, the scroll is really presented as a, a kind of a waveform um, indicating sort of ecological boom bust cycles and uh, the idea of sort of, yeah, any, any sort of boom bust cycle economically, environmentally, you see these things kind of trying to trend towards um, a sort of equilibrium, but then there's, there always is some sort of collapse at some point and then it kind of trends back upwards again. Um, and yeah, I wanted to tie, uh, tie the, the scroll back to like scripture again, um, but also, uh, using receipt paper itself, tying it back into, uh, capitalism and economies of scale. So, uh, and then for the installation, we decided to put the, the remnants of the, uh, the, the roll, the scroll roll on the, the pen that I wrote the names with. And um, yeah, I, I really just, I wanted to try and emphasize as much as I could the number of deaths here um, and try and communicate this without being um, grotesque or uh, belittling of the context of the work. So I, I kept the names uh, intentionally small so that uh, you had to really approach the work and be in proximity to it to kind of have things be legible. And um, yeah, so this work actually leads into the work that I'm doing collaboratively with Michelle. Um, so basically we're, we've kind of decided um, that 
we wanted to work with clay. Uh, Michelle has worked for a long time with uh, hand processed local clays. And I've always really liked the idea of working with kind of, you would call it raw clay? Is that? Yeah. 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 People call it wild clay. Which wild clay. Different. Yeah. But it's just, no, it's forged clay. It's not wild. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're basically, we're running a series of workshops, some of which are actually happening this weekend. Sorry, I keep fidgeting. My mustache is getting stuck. Um, so we're running a series of workshops where we're actually, we're, we're making these uh, kind of open links for a chain um, with this natural clay. And then we're um, inscribing or uh, using letterpress to um, push the names into the surface of the clay. And we're incorporating into the clay uh, different medicinal and edible species of plants, um, a large number of which we're trying to source from uh, species that are kind of indigenous to this area, um, which has been somewhat difficult because it's kind of post harvest, like seed harvest time for a lot of species that I was hoping to use. Um, but yeah, so each chain basically, or each chain link basically will represent one of the individuals uh, from the scroll and from the ongoing list of names that we're actively compiling. And so here uh, for us, clay is really acting as a sort of a bodily element. Um, Again, relating back to uh, like the idea of scr in scripture of um, people being built out of clay. And uh, it's, it's also a material that is very um, dominant in a lot of soils from around the world, especially in uh, river deltas. Um, and it's, it's just a beautifully workable material. Uh, and so the, the links will actually not be fired. They'll be kept raw and coated in beeswax, correct? So we can keep building this chain uh, over the period of, um, well, basically until we have sort of um, a length that we're really satisfied. Well, I mean, that's a bad word for it, but um, a, a compelling length. Years. Yeah, we're yeah. So there, there's a couple of exhibitions that, we're, that we're, we've applied to and residencies and things that I'm considering and one show that I'm in in the spring that I'm hoping to bring this work into instead of the work that I had originally proposed. So at the, at the kind of the conclusion of this project, what we're hoping to do is have the chain presented um, with, you know, concluding thoughts about the project in an exhibition space uh, or a community space. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a museum or a gallery. And um, the chain itself will be kind of not broken apart, but taken apart because the, the links are open and um, giving them to participants who, uh, who come to the space and um, asking them that they take them home. And uh, because they're coated in beeswax, uh, they will still be biodegradable. So we're asking that people take the chain links home and plant them and they will sprout after uh, sort of suitable conditions are met. And, um, result in, you know, uh, plants that are food, medicine, um, beneficial for the environment in that area. Uh, so we're working with quite a variety of different plants. Cattails are one, uh, calendula. Um, I, I have too many plant species running through my mind right now, but clover, um, clover yeah, white clover, we picked up some of that today. Um, Anyway, I think I think this step is really especially important as the names are commended back to the land and uh, given an opportunity to be memorialized in uh, an ephemeral way and kind of tying back to the original kind of message that I had about everything that we know um, right now will eventually, you know, fall down and return to the earth. And um, yeah, I think that's kind of an appropriate note to end on, I guess. Uh, yeah, thank you. So first of all, I want to thank Michelle and Paul. Those were amazing talks, and, and I'm full of questions as well. Uh, but I don't want to monopolize this. So what we'll do, I'll ask a few questions, just a couple, one to each of the artists, and then I want to hear a little bit more about, about the project that Paul and Michelle were just talking about, the Sewing Clay Project. And then I'll try and open it up so we, we can hear from you and your questions. Uh, I'm going to ask both artists a question that I think um, their work may be 
raises certain challenges. Um, and challenges, I think, for artists are maybe challenges um, in relation to the terrain that they're working in. And so with Michelle, I wanted to ask about how you think about the relationship between expression and rhetoric. And so, you know, I know that Michelle's work involves a real interest in opening up narratives and difficult truths and effectively sharing that information. But you also really acknowledge your own subjectivity, your own uh, culpability or in inferred culpability. And so I wonder how you think about balancing, in a sense, the need to tell and affect or the need to actually take, recognize your own position and express something from a place of, well, we could have used the word authenticity, but that's the wrong word today. Yeah, I think that storytelling is increasingly, as I'm honest with myself, what I'm interested in and finding that balance between my love of making and my love of telling and being very excited about the stories that I have to share. Um, and it's funny because I don't want to step away from the material object. I think the like long processes that I engage with give me time to sit with the stories that I want to tell and, and, and really consider them and get anxious about them and then work through that. And then, um, but then they become sites to engage the public on those stories. And the more compelling visually, aesthetically the piece is, the longer that my, an audience will stay with me, hopefully. And um, my engagement with, with them is always so important to me. Like, I will go in and do a tour and like talk to one person if I can talk to one person. Um, and that's why I make the audio works when that's possible. Um, part of the exhibition was also a, a symposium that brought together people from very diverse relationships with bison. Um, so it's not just about my own subjectivity, but opening things up to other people's as well. Um, and yeah, and I think that the, the objects often like materialize the story in, in interesting ways. Um, and I think they stay expressive because they're so personal to me. And they're so personal not because they're autobiographical, but because of the empathy and the passion that I invest in them. Um, and because I think that even though when they're historical, they're still like very urgent to this moment and they, they matter in a way that's important to me. Um, so now I'm moving into this like strange position in my career where often I'm working outside of arts institutions and they want to engage with the public on their, you know, specific things that politically I align with. Um, and so that's where I get like concerned about the term rhetoric because to me that like often connotes uh, convincing someone. And I think that my job in making art in these spaces is to um, reach people in an unexpected way through art and open up their empathetic imagination, um, which I think is different than persuading them necessarily. And um, yeah, so I think like for me, the balance is making work that is personally meaningful, but that also resonates with a diverse audience. And that the diversity of the audience has always been like, very important to me. Great. No, thank you very much. It's a great answer. And it strikes me that um, when you're working with the more than human, you're working with animals, um, there is a way in which we can, you know, that could be the terrain of, of sentimentality, but not action, or a terrain of mm -hmm. where, where we don't actually um, recognize animals as having agency or, or, or needing to be recognized as having agency. So it strikes me that that balance of, of the two things that you're talking about is, is really important to fundamentally using good information mm -hmm. and also really engaging us at a level of our, you know, our likeness with, with our animal kin. Um, so Paul, I, I, you know my question, um, and it's that in the times in which we're living, gardening and replanting uh, are regularly understood as important and ethically positive for humans to be involved in. You know, you say gardening and everybody thinks that's a good thing. 
But we know that the history of colonialism involves a lot of troubling involvements with human or by humans in cultivation, in monetizing land, including land that was acquired unfairly. So I wonder how you think about in, in essence, that kind of history, and then the notion that gardening is is de facto a good thing for us all to be involved in. Mm -hmm. I think the like as I get older, the one thing that I really keep going back to is that there there aren't very many things that I think when you continue to poke at it and pick at it that are like inherently good or bad. There's just a, like a lot of gray, like a big spectrum of gray. Um, and I think we, we tend to like moralize a lot of things that um, don't necessarily have to be. But um, to try and answer your question satisfactorily, um, I think that living or attempting to live with something other than yourself, whether that be as a parent or um, as a member of a community or as a gardener or um, uh, I don't want to say owner of a pet, but um, co-resider with a pet, companion. a companion with a pet. Thank you. Donna Haraway. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that it can only ever um, help you to uh, enlarge in your worldview and consider not only the needs of yourself but the needs of other things and other, um, I mean, other living things specifically, but also thinking about things that are traditionally thought of as non living or inert, like the land itself, um, which I mean in different cultures isn't considered that way at all. But um, yeah, I think gardening for me is a way of living with plants um, and and working with them in a, in a kind of self-serving way in that eventually a lot of the plants that I grow, I will consume in some way, um, either as medicine or as food, but also trying to think about the needs of the plant practically in terms of what uh, things they need to survive and thrive. Um, but yeah, and and I think that one of the difficult things like as a settler is thinking about the land that we live on. Um, and I think in a way, uh, my work with hydroponics um, sort of highlights that because I'm working in a way that the land is kind of disembodied um, with hydroponics. I didn't really define it, but a couple of weeks ago, I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, so I'll reiterate that it's it's a, a horticultural process. Uh, um, that's not a process. Practice, thank you. It's a practice where you're not using soil, um, which is incredibly biodiverse and beautiful as a material. Um, soil is like a really beautiful like living assemblage in and of itself but hydroponics are kind of a, a western sort of attempt at like compartmentalizing all these different nutrients and like micromanaging things in a sort of very scientific um, controlled way and I mean sometimes it works out really well and in a lot of cases you find that um, in different studies they're finding more and more that species require that interconnection with um, mycorrhizal networks, so uh, mushroom networks that connect everything together and help plants share nutrients and um, communities of insects and other plants. So it, yeah, I, I mean, I know I'm not really answering the, the question directly, <laughs> but uh, this is how I answer questions. Um, I just kind of think about it out loud. Um, yeah, I think it's like super problematic that I live here, but pretty much everything I do is problematic. So I guess you just have to kind of reconcile with being a consumer at some point as well. Like you have to eat to live. Um, so, well, and I and I do think uh, I think about a number of things in relation to what you're talking about. Um, I think we do have to live with complexity. 
Yeah. And so I think that, um, you know, when Michelle was talking about her experience with the, um, the cattle farmers who were so attuned to the heartbeats and the lives of, of their subjects that they were eventually going to slaughter, it strikes me that, that that's in line with what we're talking about, that obviously there are histories that we inherit that are highly troubled. And there are human practices that ultimately, I guess, if we want to think of the food chain, et cetera, et cetera, are so inculcated with our, within our way of being on the planet, but are highly problematic. And at the same time, you know, I think to be able to live some of that complexity in an analyzed way, in a way where we're working with good information and where we're also recognizing that to over politicize everything before we actually examine it. Um, and that includes, you know, thinking about who are farmers, etc. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, some of what you're raising really does actually talk about the kind of both and uh, world that we lived in and, and that, you know, as somebody involved with plants or the more than human, you know, I mean, we're never going to be sort of uh, objectively pure or, or somehow above reproach. But, you know, that's part of our our mission, I suppose, as, as humans on the earth. I think it's kind of like, um, it's not very productive to just try and make the most ethical thing you possibly can. Although that's an admirable effort. It's, it's like, yeah, you, you just after this unattainable goal of yeah. making like something that doesn't impact anything negatively, like everything we do impacts something negatively. And that, that's actually the best advice. That's the best question maybe you've ever asked of me was like when I came in and started doing my PhD, you know, in my own life, I try and have a plant-based life, like almost exclusively. And I thought I could make this work and extend those politics to the work itself. And in that way, you know, stay not pure, but not implicated in a way. And I think that the work, because it asks me to do difficult things that I don't take lightly, um, they, they carry that difficulty in them and are, are more complicated and difficult and more worthwhile, I guess, in the end. Well, and I think that's why art can speak to us because I think that if it's all just about ideology, then there's a way in which it sort of doesn't touch us where we live. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that if we've actually got to sort of live and breathe this stuff, then we know that we're not, we're never going to be sort of above reproach. But the acknowledgement of that and the living with that while we aspire to something better or something more, you know, more fair and, and just, you know, I think that's where the, the sort of the living, breathing art can, can really exist. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that like something that both of us kind of work with is um, not making work that is just about like bringing attention to an issue, but like actively trying to change something. Um, yeah, because I think we're beyond raise awareness. Yeah, we're like way beyond. That. Um, yeah, I don't want to get into like, are we too far to do anything about it? Because I don't want to be a nihilist. But yeah, I think that like as an artist working in the public realm. You can, and I mean, I don't want to say should, but I, I think that we should be like working towards building the world that we want to live in at this point. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't think that we can like sit around and wait for it at this point. Yeah, yeah I heard this. Can I, yeah. Keep I heard this um, really interesting term, which sounds really silly on its surface, but it was hope punk. And it's, um, I think when I was young, because I'm old woman now, when I was young, uh, being punk was all about like nihilism and apathy and um, sarcasm. And that's really unsatisfying. Uh, as I've gone on my life, it's really unsatisfying. And so this idea of hope punk, like facing um, very difficult truths and a very difficult, a very um, demoralizing world sometimes and not escaping from it, but facing it with empathy and kindness and generosity um, can be a radical act. And that's like something I'm going to hold as I move forward. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, I have other questions, but I think we should open it up if some of you have 
questions, and some of them might be related specifically to things that Paul and Michelle were talking about individually. Um, I mean, we could keep going a little bit around your, your sewing clay project, but I'm interested if any of you have things you'd like to ask. I know it's not always easy. I have a question for Michelle. Yeah. Um, so you were mentioning how uh, you went to, like, in person to uh, experience these vitamins and um, experience their energy or like, whatnot. Um, did you already in your mind have an idea of your artworks that you were planning on using? Or did you completely go there and go, I'm feeling this out and I'm doing what I feel is appropriate for this? Yeah, I went with my, I went with my cameras, but I didn't really think that it was like, I was moving away from photo-based practice already at that point, and I really just went with a lot of microphones, and I went to sit and listen. And um, the nice thing about being an artist uh, asking questions of scientists is that um, they can kind of drop the facade a little bit of objectivity and, and um, be a nerd with you and be enthusiastic and explain things on your level. And so sitting with the, the biologists that worked at the park, that was also a big part of it. And I, I you know, thought I was going to make some kind of sound piece out of it. And I didn't really think it was going to be the sole focus of the next five years going. Like, it's not ending, so forever. Um, yeah, but it's just the way life happens. Thank you. Great. Others? Thoughts? Yes. Okay, so you, uh, my question is for Michelle. Um, yeah, so like you said, you've been really interested in Biden for like five years. Kind of, be, is there something in memory from previous before that that really maybe made the Biden like striking to you? Uh, or is it kind of a surprise encounter that evolved from that five year point on or something from childhood or memory as a Canadian or something? You know, I, because I grew up in Ontario. And I, I went to Winnipeg to do my master's, and the you go to Manitoba, and the bison is everywhere. It's on the license plate, like it's on everything, everything, and and so like people from Manitoba don't notice it, but then but I did, and and as soon as I went to the park and I was talking to people, and I was thinking about because I was already very interested in conservation and conservation stories, and then the bison just held all of that within them, on top of being this incredibly charismatic creature. Um, yeah, I don't know, I grew up around horses, like I was a horse kid, and uh, so just a love of large, dewy-eyed animals in general, <laughs> but um, yeah, and, there, and um, when you hear biologists talk about the complexity of their relationship with ecosystems and the land and how they call them like the engineers of the landscape them and, and beavers and it's easy to fall in love with them yeah keystone species right? keystone species yeah <clears throat> it's an interesting question um thanks spencer um and it makes me think that it's a kind of ethnographic question although that that term you know might be a little bit fraught but actually it makes me think paul <laughs> what kind of ethnography might um, influence the kind of work you're doing? Oh man, like, <laughs> yeah, it depends on the plant species you talk about because every, like, you'd be hard pressed to find a plant that doesn't have some sort of ethnobotanical history behind it as a medicine or a food or a poison. Um, we're, as a species, we're really good at finding uses for things, I think is uh, the takeaway. And I mean, we're really good at eliminating things that we perceive as not having a use as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know. If, if well, really but I it. think, but I'm also asking about your ethnography. And I don't, I just mean, are, were there things in your growing up or in your background that pointed to the kind of work that you find yourself doing today? Uh, I mean, yeah, my, I was raised, um, like we, we didn't have a lot of money, uh, like as a family growing up. I mean, we weren't, yeah, like we were, we were okay, but like for a holiday, we didn't necessarily go far away. We camped. And like that was really formative for me, um, just being outside. Uh, and I was like, I'm pretty fortunate in that I was raised in a period where um, we still had the like play till dusk type 
lifestyle, but I also had the internet. So after dusk, I could like research stuff or <laughs> play games. Like, yeah. So um, I think that kind of background really helped. And like going doing doing my BA at uh, Guelph was really formative as well mm. because um, Guelph has kind of a reputation as being a hippie school with like the, the OAC and having a really strong uh, environmental studies program. And not having done a Bachelor of Fine Arts, I did a, like a Bachelor of Arts in general. And so my minor was in geography and I did a lot of uh, study outside of fine art. And even today, most of the research that I and reading that I do isn't about art proper. It's more about ecology and environmentalism and philosophies around those things. So I think like that kind of really helped form my trajectory was just like having parents that um, that really fostered that and like being outside. Um, don't get me wrong, I had periods where I played a lot of video games too. <laughs> but yeah, I think just like being with being with the thing that you care about is really important. Like that proximity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> well, and I think that, you know, probably a lot of you are in, in studio classes and one of my questions, which we won't get to was, you know, sort of what's the relationship really between some of the kinds of work that Michelle and Paul are doing and the more discipline specific things we might be doing in a drawing or a painting course, etc. But, you know, I think your answer and the way Michelle has been talking about her work, it strikes me that, you know, being in an art environment can provide a really great platform for you to develop skills because we all need skills and we might not necessarily use those very skills when we move on to to make more mature artwork but it, so it's a platform and then i think if you have an opportunity to look at yourself and look at the world and yourself in relation to the world the way you're talking about um, you know putting those together developing skills and understanding how traditional materials are used so you know if you actually want to use those or you want to reinterpret them um, you know I think that that can be a really wonderful combination I think one way of looking at it would be like art is a type of language that you're using to communicate other ideas like you're not making art about art necessarily yeah like you're making art about other things in your life that are fun mm -hmm. yeah 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 and I think like when I work with students in the university or often I work with younger kids too. It's about like zeroing in on what their passion is and then finding the way to manifest that and express it. And, um, you know, I can teach myself to do a lot of things with YouTube. Like <laughs> we can help them find the language like in the medium that suits what it is that they care about. And yeah, I just find that's like a really effective way to like teach them problem solving as an art practice and zero in on what matters to them. Little kids have like a really, they're really good at honing in on like the kind of work that you have to do, mm -hmm. like environmental work. Mm -hmm. They can really like cut through the layers of stuff that we get in our head about. Yeah. Well, and maybe to kind of wrap it up, I would say that one of the privileges of being in a university, in a university art environment, is you have a chance to kind of go deep in a way that may become quite nerdy and maybe not going to be the thing you're going to do in your life, you know, do silver point drawing or something like that. But, you know, I think that in a world in which we can learn endlessly from YouTube, it's great to have that in combination with actually learning in an environment where there is an investment in the past and also a sense that the future is always ahead of us and we're responsible for that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do see in the in the kinds of work you're both doing a real sort of balance between some kind of deep understanding of, of what it is to be invested in, in certain crafts that we think of in relation to art. And then also the fact that the world has so much to tell us that we need to respond to and be responsible around. And, and that's also a really necessary way to think about what the life of an artist can be. So anyway, maybe with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you all very much. You've been tremendously attentive and it's been really fun. Thank you.